So, if you have your sword, your Bible, and I hope you do, if you would turn to Matthew, uh, chapter 4, verse 25. Matthew chapter 4, verse 25. And all of us, or hopefully all of us, not that maybe most of us know that we have what we call four Gospels in our Bibles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're not, if I could use the word, redundant. They're not just repetitive. Though they have the one dominant figure, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But they... Each one comes, uh, the perspective of the Lord, maybe with a different emphasis. And just as a little example, maybe I, I tried to calculate this, so my figures I hope were somewhat accurate. But to give you a little example, comparing Matthew with John. Uh, in John, the word believe is 86 verses which would be natural because in the, John says the purpose of his gospel is that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing we might have life in his name. So some 86 verses in John has to do with belief. But in Matthew, there's only nine verses. And then on the other way around, Matthew speaks of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, some 54 verses but there's only nine verses about the, the kingdom in John. So you can just see there, there's just a different emphasis, there's a different perspective, even though it's the same topic, the same grand subject, the Lord Jesus there. And in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's, um, they follow the Lord where he went, what he did, what he said, and, but there's maybe three, at least three, great grand teachings, if I can word it like that. There's what we would call the Sermon on the Mount, from Matthew 5 to 7 there, where the Lord sits down and he teaches his disciples. And then later on, we have what is called the Olivet Discourse, where the disciples come to the Lord shortly before he goes to Calvary, and they said, what, what is this end of the age and the sign of your coming? They want to know, what, would the, what are the signs of the end of your coming again? And in Matthew 24, and it's also in Luke and in Mark, the Lord Jesus speaks of the signs that there would be at the time of the end of the age and his coming in great glory. And then lastly, in John, starting in uh, chapter 13, we read there that, that the Lord Jesus, having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And then in, uh, from 13 on to about 17, if we include that, that prayer of the Lord, it's that intimate, it's that close scene in the upper room before Calvary where the Lord Jesus speaks with his own, the disciples there. And uh, great and grand and wonderful teachings each of them have for us. And I was going to look at the Sermon on the Mount today, here, which begin, I'll read the beginning, we'll look at the bookends, the beginning in uh, Matthew 4.25. Remember, there was no chapter breaks. When Matthew wrote this, he didn't say chapter 4, chapter 5, verse. So, in our chapter 4, verse 25, of what Matthew wrote, we read, and there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came unto him. So we see in the beginning of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, um, that it is to his disciples that he sits down and he speaks to them. And then at the end, in chapter 7, at the conclusion, we read in chapter 7, verses 28, down to chapter 8, verse 1, just the three verses. And it came to pass, 
when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And so in concluding there, the thing that stood out, you know, and I guess would, um, at the conclusion of those grand teachings and sayings of the Lord, was that he spoke with authority. And I think we're able to miss that. Remember a long time ago, I was reading a, a Jewish rabbi who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But after having read what we call the Sermon on the Mount, this rabbi said, who do you think you are, God? And we can understand why he would think that and why we believe that. In, in uh, chapter 5, a multitude of times, if you look at chapter 5, verse 22, in each of these times, the Lord will precede the saying by, you have heard that it was said of them by them of old. But in verse 22, but I say unto you, and then in verse 28, but I say unto you. In verse 32, but I say unto you. In verse 34, but I say unto you. In verse 39, but I say unto you. With authority, and it just set the people back when they heard that. He wasn't just re repeating what this commentator said or what that rabbi said or that because, but what I say unto you, direct there, the authority that the Lord Jesus had. I, I don't know who gave the name of these teachings, the Sermon on the Mount. I think we kind of have a negative um, conception of that word. If you want to go to church and hear a sermon, right? You know, you think going to go. Or if you're a child, you're a teen, and you did something, and mom or dad is going to give you a sermon. Or, you know, it just means, as we take it, it's something negative. You've done something wrong and someone's going to try and set you straight. As far as I know, the word sermon isn't in our Bible. I, don't, I have to double check that. I don't believe it's in the, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. But it says that he taught them, that he sat down, he opened his mouth and taught them. That's much more comfortable, isn't it? To me it is, that I'm going to get a sermon. And in chapter 5, verse 19, one of the things the Lord says, Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of, the le one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So I, it seems like the Lord is addressing the Jewish audience here, his disciples. Maybe what they understood is that the rabbis, out of the 613 rules, laws that they had kind of distilled uh, the Bible into there, that there were commandments that were great, and then there were commandments that were small and little. And the Lord Jesus saying here that every commandment, you know, is great. And those that do and teach, not just me up here teaching, but to do and teach, you know, there will be a corresponding whether you're small or great. And there's um, one, one or two verses in Deuteronomy that, that the, our Jewish friend said that this is the least commandment. This isn't a great big commandment, but this is not only a little commandment, but it's the smallest commandment. Now, the Bible doesn't say that, but that's what they say. And it's in Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy 22, verse 6 and 7, and this is what they say is the least commandment. If you come across a bird's nest beside the road, either in a tree or on the ground, and the mother is sitting on the young or on the eggs, do not take the mother with the young. 
You may take the young, but be sure to let the mother go. Look at the blessing that's wrapped up in this. So that it may go well with you, and you may have a long life. Reminds me of a, a proverb, now I'm digressing a little bit here. But in Proverbs 11, 17, the merciful man does good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubles his own flesh. So there, just being merciful and kind, there's something that's good and healthy to your soul. But anyway, our Jewish friends said that, that that is the least commandment. So I kind of looked at Matthew here, and something happened to me, something that, I, that happened to me, then something I heard, it reminded me of a, of a, a verse here in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, the teaching on the Mount. I wonder, would this be the, the littlest, the smallest thing the Lord has commanded and told us in here? Now, it's all of equal importance. I don't think there's some that are big and some that are little. But it might be one that we might just read right over and think, oh, that's so tiny, that's so little. What a tiny commandment. And it would be, well, this is my take on it. The Lord didn't say this is the smallest. But in chapter 5, verse 47, we read, And if you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the heathen so. Wow, the Lord Jesus says, if we only greet, we only say hello, to our friends or our brothers or Christians or whatever, what good is that? Don't even the, the heathen, the unbelievers do it. Well, what is it in the power of a hello? Uh, I kind of had a fear when I was putting these thoughts together, thinking with, with all the important and heavy and cataclysmic things that are happening in the world, in our homes, in their lives, I'm thinking, you know, if I spoke on this and you go home and someone says, what was the quote, the sermon about? You should say hi to people. <laughs> but I think it might be a little bit more than that. And I'll tell you why. I was in Tesco. This is a couple weeks back. And I was um, waiting at the self-checkout. And as I went, whatever I had, I'm going to the self-checkout. There was a mom. She had her shopping cart. And there was a little girl. She was standing up in the cart. And... She had like uh, strawberry blonde hair and freckles. She was about two years old or so. And she turned, she looked at me, this old guy, and she said, hello. <laughs> I was so blessed with that. And so I checked out and then mom and the little one, they were being, you know, she was wheeling, mom was wheeling the little one out or whatever. And um, got to say goodbye, we got a quick goodbye. And I don't know if I'll ever see them again or whatever. But I was, that just blessed me. And then, not too long after that, I don't think, I, was, I heard this um, little story that, and I, I can't remember all the details, so I'm going to go, and it's dangerous for me to go by my, my Swiss cheese memory. But it went something like this, that in San Francisco, people that are at the end of themselves and they're going to do a final act of violence on their bodies, commit suicide, that they go to the Golden Gate Bridge and they might jump off. And there was a man, I guess he was in the police department or whatever, but whenever that happens, it was his job to go and investigate why, try to figure out what drove this person to do this, and maybe even... Maybe they didn't do it themselves, but there was something malicious or sinister that somebody else kind of set it up. So, if I got it right, this official, he would go to the house, if I could call the person a victim, and look to see if there was a note or evidence. And I think that the officer got quite hardened because there was just a pattern. Somebody did this terrible deed to themselves. He would go, he would look, he would find a note, and maybe... Many of these notes are kind of the same. But it happened once, and the official went and found a note, and it was a note like none other, and it just set him back. And the gist of the note was, the person said, I'm going to go and do what we're talking about. I'm going to go and do that. 
On my way there, if one person says hello to me, I will turn back and come home. And the fact that the officer, the official, read the letter, you know what the outcome was. Wow. The power in a hello there. So that little girl blessed me, and who knows how we or anybody else could have been such a blessing to that person there. There was um, years ago, we belonged to a church back in America, and it's what I guess you would call a mega church, meaning there was hundreds and hundreds of people there. I think there was two or three services and all that. And we were going there, and there was something that in that church it bothered me. And not only did it bother me, but it was starting to make me angry. I'll tell you what it was. I would go to church on a Sunday, and all of the multitudes of people coming and going, and milling in the hallways and all that, it seemed like it was just the same as if I went to the shopping mall. You know how you go to the shopping mall, and people just look ahead, or people have a stern face, people don't even turn to look at you or ask about you, it's just strangers passing strangers. And that bothered me in this church, that we would just go, and, and it was just so impersonal. But it came to the point where I, instead of being angry, instead of being upset, I kind of said to myself, you know what? I'm going to go and do it. I'm going to go say hello. I'm going to make a difference. I'm not going to be like that. And it made all the difference when I was in this church. If I saw someone by themselves, just in the hallway, whatever, how are you doing? You know, giving a, a hello and trying to make a, a connection there. Wow, the power in a hello. There, we went to a wedding uh, a good number of years ago. The, the bride's name was Sinead. And Sinead is a lovely Christian girl. It was a Christian wedding and this and that. And then the afters at the reception, the restaurant and all of that, people stand up and they give speeches. And Sinead's newly minted father-in-law he got up to give a speech. And he said the one thing that struck him, well, he didn't quite word it like that, but what he was talking, what he was saying in effect was that the thing that struck him about his new daughter-in-law was that he said something like this. He said, you know, when you get older, people see through you. In other words, he said, you become invisible when you get older. But there was something about his new daughter-in-law that she wasn't like that that people weren't invisible to her, that she saw them, I guess she recognized them, and, and she drew them to herself, and she was drawn to them. And I always remembered that uh, after all these years. And then I happened to see, I looked it up, a thing called invisibility. And this was a, a Jewish lady, she wrote an article called Addressing the Issue of Invisibility Among Older Adults. And this is what she says, just a short paragraph. As people age, they may become less visible within their communities. It, it can seem like people who once smiled as they walked by begin passing without a glance. Seniors may feel like unwanted outsiders in society. Sadly, many participate in their own invisibility by withdrawing into isolation. I didn't want to embarrass my wife. She didn't know I was going to be saying these things today. But uh, I asked her, you ever feel invisible? She said no, which is good. Hopefully nobody in the church here feels invisible. In um, the Gospel of Mark, there's, uh, there's uh, an account of the Lord and it just warms my heart so much. And I believe it's only in the Gospel of Mark that there was a, a blind man in Mark chapter 8, I think around verse 24. And we do read in the Gospels quite a few times where the Lord Jesus heals a blind man. But in this one account, what struck me was that when the blind man was brought to the Lord Jesus, it said Jesus took him by the hand and walked out with him. Wow. 
You know, how individual, how personal. The Lord Jesus took him by the hand and walked out with him. And then the Lord Jesus went to heal him and asked him, can you see? And you may remember the account. The Lord Jesus said, I see men as trees walking. And then the Lord Jesus touches him again. And then it says that the man saw all men clearly. And I think there's a debate like, wow, why did the Lord have to heal the man twice? You know, did it not work the first time or he needed the double dose or whatever? Now, we're not told in Mark why it happened the way it did. But I'll tell you how I see it. And this is just my own personal opinion. That when the Lord Jesus healed the man's eyes, he just saw people as physical, material objects. When the Lord touched them again, he saw all men clearly. Could it be that he saw souls? That he saw people with burdens? He saw people with needs? That he saw people as God intended them to be? They weren't just inanimate objects. He saw all men clearly. I don't know. I don't know. But it, it, struck, it strikes me in that way. Um, in our Bible, you're liable to read right by it, right, as we can do when we get so familiar with things in our scriptures. But I'll just read some of these commands to you that we read in our, in our New Testament. Romans 16, 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. 1 Corinthians 16, 20. Greet one another with a holy kiss. 2 Corinthians 13, 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. 1 Peter 5, 14, greet one another with a kiss of love. In Philippians 4, 21, greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. In 3 John 1, 14, we read, the friends here send their greetings, greet the friends there by name. Now, I, some of you may get the idea here. I'm thinking of John Ryan. He's always going to make us kiss him. <laughs> well, a story that I have told, and I, I apologize if you've heard this from me more than once, but some of you may have. But there may be people here who haven't, so I get to say it again. When I first came to the Lord, I came upon a series of books by an author by the name of Richard Wormbrand. And he was a Romanian. Um, he came to faith, I think, in the 1920s or the 30s. But he was a pastor when the Nazis came. And then he was a pastor there when the communists took over. And when the communists uh, took over, um, eventually he was imprisoned, imprisoned for a total, I think, of 14 years. And he was imprisoned, I think, the first time for about seven years or so. And um, when he was released, he had prayed, in effect, saying, Lord, if there's someone else in prison that, that needs me, needs my help, send me back. And he prayed, or maybe I'm not quoting it for, word for word there. But his wife was praying with him, and it was a hesitation. Eventually she did say, Amen. He was arrested again and went back to prison. I think it was a total for 14 years. And one of the books he wrote was Tortured for Christ. And there's other books where he wrote about his experience in persecution under communist times. But I remember reading one of the books that said that in Romania, some of our Romanian friends can attest to this maybe, but the church lasts a long time because when the service is over, everybody gets a kiss. And I guess if you're a pastor standing at the door, everybody that walks by is a... You know, everybody gets the, I assume, which is a, a, a double kiss there. But something uh, Pastor Wormbrand said was when he came to America, and he did get out of Romania during communist times, I think it was Norway or somebody in Scandinavia paid a, 
a large ransom to the Romanian government to get him out. He was released and, and then did come to the United States, if I, my, my facts are correct. Um, but one of the things he has said in his book was, in Romania, they always kiss one another, but when he came to America, he never got a kiss. I guess we're much more official, you know, how you doing, or maybe a, a bit of a hugger there. And he said he never got a kiss in America. So when I was younger, uh, he was uh, coming to the area where we were living, and I thought, I remember that. He said he never got a kiss in America. So I'm in the lobby of, of the hotel where he was having the function, like of the meeting, and there he was, the man that I've been reading these books you know, from. He went walking by, so I went up to him, and I startled him. I gave him a kiss on the cheek. You know, <laughs> I think he was embarrassed. In our New Testament time, <laughs> there it was, and in other places of the world, it's it's warm, you know, and it's with that kiss, it's that embracing and that greeting there. So I don't think that we have commandments that are great and commandments that are little. But when the Lord Jesus in Matthew 5:47 there speaks about and challenges us if we only say hello to those that are our brethren, don't even the heathen do the same. There's still, I think, something very powerful, even what we might consider is the least or the smallest of the admonitions uh, that the Lord gives to us. So if you're here today, and if you feel like you just treated like an inanimate object, something that's prayed so often, uh, one of the guys in the back there, that let no one come here that is broken, go out the same way. And if you feel that way, that nobody cares or nobody wants to know, then you make the difference and you go and make that difference in somebody else's life. And I'll just close with this. We say that there's three great discourses in our Bible. There's what we call the Sermon on the Mount, the Teaching on the Mount. There's the Olivet Discourse. And then there is uh, what we call the Upper Room Discourse. So what I would like to do is actually study what we call, I'm going to call it the Teaching on the Mount. Study the Teaching on the Mount for about a month. And for those that would like an in-depth study, on the teachings on the mount. It's not just coming and listening to me, but to uh, engage and learn yourself and then come together. So I was, was thinking of doing uh, the first week would just be an introduction. And then since there's three chapters, the second week, the third week, and the fourth week. And instead of saying, well, it's going to be held this place at this time, this day, if that is something that you would like to learn, and learn together what we call the teachings on the mount. If you would come and see me at some point, text or whatever it might be, and once I know those that are interested in that study, I'll see what we can do, whether it's daytime, evening, maybe more than once during the week. But um, you let me know. And once I see who is interested in that kind of study and in that topic, we'll see about making arrangements where we can make that a reality in the day and the time. Okay? Father, we thank you. Lord, how many of the letters do we read or those introductions, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the greeting that we're given, Lord, in your word and in the, in the letters there to the various churches. Lord, we thank you that, that you are the God that gives grace, mercy, and peace. Lord, I pray that you would touch our hearts Lord, that you would give us grace, Lord, not to see men as trees walking. Lord, but that we would take the initiative, Lord, with the stranger, with the foreigner, for the downcast, Lord. And Lord, that we might do unto others as we would have others do unto us. And Father, we thank you for the gospel, that you took the initiative, that you came to us. And Lord, as we would by your grace, read these things in your word. We pray, Lord, that we would be transformed by your word. And we ask through the Lord Jesus, 
who died on that cross for our sin. Amen. <clears throat> While you're stirring about, I was just going to add this about saying hello. When I'm walking about, when I go down the footpath, I kind of make eye contact. And if someone makes eye contact, a stranger with me, I take the initiative. I say, hello, or how are you doing? Whatever it might be. But I've heard young ladies in the past say, you can't do that. So you know, young ladies, they say, if they, if they uh, take the initiative, if they say hello to a guy or whatever, he gets all kinds of other ideas. So be discerning, okay, young ladies, yeah. And um, may we make a difference in the church and in the world, our schools and our workplace, wherever we go. Okay? Okay, thank you.